I think they've been very impressed with the uh, with, with the disinflation. Uh, I mean, you could argue yes, in May we had a, a hiccup, but uh, I don't think that's. Um, I think that'll get reversed, and uh, the overall broad trends in Canadian inflation are heading down much more sharply than in the United States. It's it's a totally different kettle of fish in Canada in the sense that we do not have fiscal stimulus in this country. The deficit GDP ratio is a fraction what it is um, in the U.S., and um, we don't have 30-year fixed rate mortgages in Canada. Uh, interest rates here hit the economy a lot more um, dramatically than is the case south of the border, and you're seeing that in the data. So my sense is this. The Bank Canada let the cat out of the bag, not at the last meeting, but at the April meeting when they first invoked the term excess supply. At the April meeting, they should have started cutting rates in April because they invoked excess supply, and then they doubled down on that term at the last meeting just a few weeks ago. Well, when you are in excess supply, which means you have a disinflationary output gap, as a central banker, usually you're cutting interest rates more than just once. And in fact, Canada entered into this excess supply, supply over demand situation last summer. Uh, and the bank went on to raise rates two or three more times in the face of that because they were so shamed and ridiculed because they missed transitory uh, like almost every other central bank did. So I would say that um, the Canadian economy right now is running uh, year over year 0.5% on the demand side. And when you're tacking on, I mean, we don't have productivity in Canada, but we sure have labor force expansion. Uh, so demand, just like in the United States, running well below supply. So these inflation numbers are going to come down, whether the the economy goes into recession or not in a classical sense inflation unless you're going to take economics and throw it to the waste paper basket which since it's my profession i'm not going to do the laws of supply and demand are going to be taking inflation a lot lower in the next year so the bank canada is not nearly done yet in canada you're starting to see the early signs of a credit contraction so consumers here are becoming more frugal and they are starting to pay down debt now of course it's a long road to hoe because the the household debt to income ratio in canada is is like a Hundred and call it 170 percent. You know, it peaked in the U.S. in the biggest credit bubble of all time in the mid 2000s at 130 percent. We come off. I don't know how the authorities in Canada let it happen. We came off a massive, unsustainable, very unstable debt binge. Not as when people always look at the government sector. No, it was in the Canadian household sector, and the Canadian household debt bubble is bigger than it was in the U.S. in the in the mid 2000s. I don't know if people recognize that. And then of course we've come off the most aggressive bank Canada tightening cycle because of the pandemic and lockdown related inflation since the late 1980s. So how do you think this is going to end? You know, so we've just reached a situation where, and this has got to be in the Bank Canada's mind, where in the aggregate, 15% uh, of disposable income in the personal sector in Canada is now being siphoned into debt servicing charges. And that is the same ratio you've had before all the recessions dating back in time. So uh, households, you know, people say households have been squeezed by, you know, energy and um, property taxes and rents, food, and that's 100% true. There's a lot of things you can't substitute away from where the price levels are punishingly high. What's really crushing the consumer now, now, keeping in mind that, you know, most Canadians don't have a mortgage. Most Canadians are debt free, but you know, a recession is always a change at the margin. Uh, not everybody loses a job in recession, right? It's that small fraction that moves the needle because uh, the recession after all is just like a one to 2% haircut on GDP. It doesn't go to zero, but it's the change at the margin. And for the most stressed out borrowers, just like we had in the US back in 2007, 2008, 2009, it's always a small group that gets the, um, the ball rolling uh, on the recession. It's not the majority, it's the minority, but the minority we're looking at the overall numbers right now and we're going to be heading into and already in a delinquency and default cycle and then if you don't default on your debt you're going to have to find ways to pay back your lender at these uh, more exorbitant interest rates as you reset into them this is just how the cycle works but this is a very unusual cycle because we never got into a recession before in Canada with household balance sheets so stretched you know people talk about what great shape the American balance sheet is on the consumer side not so much on the government on the consumer side the household balance sheet in Canada is about the most stretched in the world and we're bumping against interest rates that we have not seen really since the crow years and it's not the level of rates that matters but it's the change and, and this is really ongoing the economy is not fully reset into this interest rate environment so debt service and what it does to discretionary spending is a big part of it you can come and say well but what about incomes isn't income growth well where's 
income growth going to go in Canada? Once again, unless you believe that we're going to take the laws of economics and throw them away, where do you think wage growth in Canada is going with the unemployment rate? It's already gone up 140 basis points from the low. We've gone from 5.8% at the cycle low. We're at 6.2 right now. The unemployment rate is higher now than it was before COVID hit in early 2020 when the Bank Canada rate was 175, not 475. So everything operates with a lag. So wages are going to adjust to this excess labor environment by decelerating. And that's going to make the debt service ratio that much more onerous. So, you know, um, in Canada, you know, the consumer is not 70% of GDP. We're not Consumerica, but it's more like, let's call it 60% of GDP. It still bulks large in the numbers. And the Canadian consumer is going to be in a very rough spot, the penalty box, uh, for an extended period of time. And what's interesting is that the senior brass at the Bank Canada will never talk about this. I mean, don't forget that the Bank Canada governor reports into the finance minister who is an elected politician. But the Bank Canada staffers, I'm amazed that the Bank Canada even let this be published to the public. Um, wrote a whole report on what, what things are going to look like for people with a mortgage and what's going to happen with their spending over the course of the next couple of years, not the next couple of quarters. So this problem of excess supply and excess capacity in the Canadian economy, which is fundamentally disinflationary, I'll tell you the truth, James, I cannot believe. I read all these other Bay Street economists and I read what happened after the May CPI number and it's like, oh my God, the bank can't cut rates now. Look at this CPI number. The pre It's so myopic. If I'm at the Bank Canada, I'm not looking at one data point. I'm looking at what are the underlying pressures on inflation. What is that telling us about our inflation forecast? I'm sick and tired of central bankers or people who call the central bank say, well, they're data dependent. You know how ridiculous that is to say that you're data dependent when all the data are contemporaneous or lagging. The Bank Canada should be forecast dependent. And they're telling us some valuable information. The Canadian economy has slipped into excess supply, excess capacity. I talked to non-economists about this and their eyes just glaze over. No, this is actually really important because it matters for where interest rates are going. It matters for how the Bank Canada will be independent relative to the Fed and why that's going to put downward pressure on the Canadian dollar. There's so many important things out of these powerful words for two meetings in a row called excess supply. But here's the problem that excess supply is going to be widening and that's going to be creating either disinflation pressure or god forbid deflation pressure in the canadian economy over the course of the next several quarters and years and nobody's got that factored into their forecasts well look you're you're taking stuff i wrote probably a year or two years ago the, the bubble isn't being pricked but the bubble in canada is the helium is coming out of the balloon but yeah when we looked at at the peak and the peak is behind us we looked at the peak of the housing bubble in canada and you looked at classic measures of uh home prices to rents or home prices to income all these ratios yeah it was bigger than the u.s and then we did all this affordability analysis and said well you know if incomes and interest rates aren't going to help help us out home prices in canada would have to come down between 20 and 30 percent to equilibrate what is an ongoingly super strained homeowner affordability ratio and those were the sorts of numbers i was using in the states back in the mid 2000s when people like ben bernanke were saying well home prices never go down so yeah but i say that right now the housing market is gradually moving into better balance but but part of this equation is going to mean lower home prices so uh look bad news for existing homeowners your the price of your priced assets is going to be going down but it's like money illusion because you know your neighbor's house price is going to go down too what it means is that those people who've been sitting on the fence who've been renting that couldn't afford to come into the home ownership market are going to get that chance and you'll finally I mean the silver lining is that uh, the kids will finally move out of the basement and find their own place well it was a close election but it was the first time that the Liberal Party lost this riding uh, since 1993 it was a liberal uh, stranglehold and so I think it is it is I think an important litmus test for sure um, but every single poll every poll not just one is showing that the liberals are behind the conservatives by at least 20 percentage points you know uh most of the polls are suggesting that uh, the conservatives are gonna you know it's, it's going to be a, a very significant sweep unless something changes between now and october 2025 i don't know why it will because the economy in canada is going to go from bad to worse and uh the liberals uh, are gonna are gonna wear that uh, I, I think that if i was advising them i guess they feel that um they could have a fairness budget uh, and that'll sell to the public so they raise capital gains taxes just as the economy is making a transition to a recession. I mean, I've never 
never seen that before. Heading into recession, let's raise taxes in the name of fairness. Um, however, when you raise taxes on uh, entities of the economy that are job creators, uh, you're not going to get very good results. So yeah, I think that, uh, you know, they say, well, you know, post 2016 with Trump surprisingly beating Hillary that, oh, you can't believe the polls, can't believe the polls. Well, I'll tell you this much. I think that um, the pollsters have done a better job uh, than they did back in 2016. And let's wait and see what happens. I think July the 4th is the uh, UK election. Uh, and there it's going to be Labour overtaking the Conservatives. They're also 20 percentage points up in the polls. Um, let's see how well the polls do there. But that could be another litmus test. But, you know, you see around the world, there's political change taking place. Uh, you see it in Mexico. Uh, you saw it even in India where Modi had to couple together a coalition rather surprisingly. Uh, look what's happening in France and within the EU right now and what's about to happen in the UK. But the other part about in Canada is that you take a look historically and uh, you know when you're when you have a when you're in power 10 years you know it's game over. Uh, I don't know why Justin Trudeau would want to subject himself to the next next election um, but generally and the same thing happened to his father. The same thing happened to Brian Mulroney. Um, you know after 10 years even if you don't have faulty policies and notwithstanding the popularity people just basically get tired of a government after 10 years and I think that's what we're seeing right now. I mean believe it or not you know Canada at the federal level has a, a lot more latitude to do things to stimulate uh, than the U.S. does. Uh, I mean, I mean, the U.S. I mean, look, the, the America is the reserve currency, but uh, their debt ratio is so far above ours. I mean, it's I think it's almost triple, and our deficit to GDP ratio is pretty pretty low, especially on the G7 ladder. Um, but I wouldn't do it through spending. That's for sure. We have too much big government in this country to begin with, and that's one of the things that concerns me is that over this past decade, the corporate share, the business share. Now, look, I am an unabashed capitalist. I believe in uh, the free enterprise system. And so I think that there's always a problem when the business sector share of GDP is going down and the government share of GDP is going up. That's why productivity is a big problem in this country. We have to rely on immigration to boost growth because we can't do it through productivity because we have a government that doesn't try to promote capital formation. You do that by cutting taxes. So you do it by cutting top marginal rates. You can do it through depreciation allowances. I think that finally in Canada, we have to cobble together with the provinces uh, to reduce um, interprovincial barriers to trade. Uh, but I think that, um, you know, what you want to do is, and look, we have massive direct investment outflows uh, out of the country. And you see this, by the way, to take, you know, go interview Canadian hockey teams. They can't attract, there's a reason, I mean, the Oilers came close. However, you speak to Canadian hockey teams, they, they can't compete with American hockey teams because the, the tax regime in this country is crazy. So that's the first thing I would do is I would do fundamental tax reform that would reduce that would reduce the tax burden. And I would prevent the deficit from spiraling by cutting spending, not the growth, cutting spending outright. It's incredible that all the spending that was supposed to be temporary coming out of COVID has managed to stay on the books. I think the spending level is like 30% higher than what the government was predicting it was going to be. Even when COVID was hitting, it was supposed to be temporary. But you see, in the in the government sector, no, no spending is ever temporary. Uh, now, this wasn't the case in the 90s under a different liberal regime, but let's face it, Jean Chrétien and Paul Martin were fiscal conservatives in the Labour Party. And that's what we have to get back to. So I would say classic, classic re reduction of the government share of the economy. Let the business sector flourish and allow their share of the economy to grow. And uh, broad-based, broad-based, top marginal tax rate reductions. That's exactly what I would do on, on day one. Well, I think that you... Um, want to take the greed factor and lock it into a box and certainly if you've been long the u.s market which is extremely concentrated uh, i mean look the the average stock in the s p 500 is unchanged from what was in early 2022 it's been really uh, you call it the mag 7 you can call it the mag 3 or maybe the mag 1 so I'm very concerned about the concentration risk uh, in the U.S. market. That said, uh, I'm very bullish on interest rates. Very bullish. So within the equity market, I would say own the rate sensitives. Uh, you can own utilities. You can own telecom services. I would say even some of these uh, select um, REITs. I think that um, you know energy like pipelines uh, look attractive, and so do their dividends and dividend yields. So I am by no means saying that my forecast is telling you uh, to go buy you know baked beans, canned tuna, barbed wire, and sawed-off shotguns. Okay, there's places to put your money. I think that there is secular growth tailwinds in uh, other parts of the world, wide swaths of, of emerging Asia, which is trading with like an eight multiple. Uh, there are, are markets in Asia that you could buy that are trading at the same multiple the U.S. was back in the summer. 
1982, which was the secular low. Um, so there's different regions. Uh, you know, the emerging Asia looks uh, good. Uh, Japan is a long-term play. Uh, they're being re-rated because of uh, the last leg of uh, Abenomics and what that's doing to shareholder returns. Um, the U.S. market is uh, way overvalued. Uh, I think that uh, commodities look interesting from a long-term perspective so there's areas that um that you can poke at you know i, I think i'd rather be in the commodity market than in the equity market right now because i think there's just a, a there's something in the commodity market that is a secular you know demand supply tailwind uh for prices doesn't mean that these commodities won't go down in a recession but not as much as they have in previous recessions because there's been no capital investment in the basic material sector for so long i, I like gold i like silver i think that once the fed starts to play catch down on interest rates with these other central banks, the US dollar bull market ends, and that's gonna be very good news for precious metals. And on top of that, I think that you want to start uh, chipping away at the bond market. Um, not much value in the Canadian bond market where the yields are so much lower than they are in the U.S. Treasury market. The U.S. Treasury market on a relative basis looks like a high yield market right now. Uh, so I like treasuries. I like treasuries and you're going to be, at least for the time being, in a better currency. Better to be in the U.S. dollar than the Canadian dollar right now. And that's uh, for the here and now. That's my investment strategy. But I would be taking profits if you've been buying the index funds count your lucky charms that a few stocks have carried your wealth along for the ride. I don't think it's sustainable and nobody ever got hurt by booking a profit. So that's the one thing that really unnerves me more than anything else, James, is that nobody in this bull market, especially this last leg where the market is up 25% with earnings up 6%. Um, it's been a largely a multiple driven market. Nobody's rebalanced. Nobody, I don't know about you personally, nobody's rebalanced. Everybody is all in. You know, I'm looking at the baby boomers, these people in their 60s and 70s heading into their 80s. You know that over 60% of their asset mix is in equities. You, when I started in the business in, in the mid 80s, someone in their 60s and 70s would have more like a 30% equity allocation. It's now more than 60%. And I'm very concerned, very concerned what happens when the turn comes because bear markets are not um, fairy tales. They exist. And so do bull markets, obviously. We're just living through one right now. I'm worried what happens when the movie runs in reverse and the implications this has on the 80 million pig in a python, you know, called the baby boom class and this is going to have a lot of social problems nobody talks about that but i'm very concerned about the uh the fact that older people retirees have bought in hook line and sinker into this um th this wild technology which is real uh, however we know what happens even in technology that uh, the the impact on the economy is real but it doesn't mean that you don't go into these financial bubbles and the market's just extremely overvalued right now so that's my my bit my big concern and that's why i'm advocating to start especially if your long equities to start thinking about taking profits and redeploying them and focus on risk adjusted returns and not just on getting rich quick.